Okay, we're going to move on swiftly to the next session, and I'm going to call onto the stage um, the former chair of uh, CMI Women, Dr. Heather Melville OBE, um, Specialist Advisor at Teneo, Managing Director, Clark Smith Advisory, and Chancellor of the University of York, and the new chair of CMI Women, who's Managing Partner at EME, Reed Smith LLP, and that's Tamara Box. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, uh, Baroness Martha Lane Fox. That was a, a fantastic call to action for all of us to start the day with. Well, Heather and I have been given a real pleasure in that we get um, a chance to just have a chat, which is great um, with you all. And we're gonna do that really thinking about uh, the Everyone Economy Report. And so Heather, I'm gonna start with uh, a question to you, but le let me preface it a little bit uh, with some of our findings. So the Everyone Economy Report provides evidence of the strides that we've made in diversity, equity, and inclusion over the last few years. What used to be seen as a data gathering exercise or a mandated measurement is now being recognized as a pathway to greater productivity and higher profits. In other words, diversity isn't the problem, we now recognize it as the solution. But while leaders may be congratulating themselves on improvement in percentages and comparative metrics, it appears that we still have a long way to go. Even those managers who have the perception that their organizations are fully inclusive in areas of gender, sexual orientation, age, race, and disability may find that the opinions of their workforce are somewhat different. The report indicated that managers reported what they thought they saw. And their picture was really rather rosy, actually. But how did they get to these 80 to 90% inclusion rates? When asked about the programs or the policies that drove inclusivity, few workers could point, frankly, to anything at all. Um, and their opinions about the degree of inclusivity in their organizations could not be more different than their managers. So the everyone economy refers to this as the perception action gap the say do, as we say, to convert a perception into reality, action is required. But few managers have prioritized EDI as an organizational objective, at least not to the degree that the strategies and programs have caught up with that. So full inclusion requires active change and change is hard. Furthermore, it can't happen if we pass off this important task to lower level workers or to HR consultants. It's our job, those of us who are in leadership and responsible for the cultures and the mindsets of our organizations, to set not only the tone, but the plan of action. So on that note, Heather, wow, that's a question. <laughs> what specifically can good leaders do to help move their organization toward greater inclusivity? That's a long question. <laughs> but what I am going to say, when I look around this room today, I look with such pride mm. because, first of all, you're all out of the office for the day. This is an investment in yourselves. Secondly, just take a minute and look around the room because this is not what conferences normally look like. Mm. And tell me if you can see what difference really looks like. This is what we need to see in organisations, a different voice, different opinion, different challenges, different opportunities and actually different talent that comes to the table. I think we've gotten to a process where we do a lot of talking. We have a lot of benchmarking. We have hundreds of projects that people are working on, or not one project is making one change mm -hmm. because it's about listening and hearing what your employees are saying to you. And by the way, what your clients are saying to you, because there's no point seeing this as a nice workforce um, issue or opportunity. This is a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. So your clients are looking at, at how you do business, who's in your workforce. Your employees and prospective employees are looking at whether or not I want to work with that organization. And by the way, why so many people leaving? The youngsters of today, we heard with um, Martha Lane Fox saying around technology, they use technology before they even talk to somebody. They want to understand mm -hmm. how many grievances have taken place in that organization. Why are people leaving? What kind of things have been said? Actually, I'm not sure if I want to work in that organization because of the reputation. So this is a bigger thing than just talking. It's around action. I, I think of it as like when you start a new project in a new country, you put all your investments behind it because you really want to put some focus and skill mm -hmm. on making that happen. 
And for me, we've been talking about diversity and inclusion for a long time. Let's stop talking about it. Let's start making sure it's integrated into everything we do. So when we're planning and starting up a new business, and there are lots of those happening at the moment, mm -hmm. when we're talking about marketing of the business, we're talking about business development of the business, we're talking about technology of the business. By the way, we need to be talking about how inclusive do we look and feel. We also need the leaders of those businesses to be challenging their peers and their subordinates who keep saying to them, I don't know where to go and look for the talent. That is such an excuse. Look around this room again. Every single one of you is talented and you bring a different ingredient to the table. So I think this is more than just a tick box exercise. And I hate that frame, but I do believe that it's still being used quite widely. Let's do this because we'll look right if we're doing this or if we're seen to be doing this. I want to change that to we've done this. So this was an idea that we had some years ago in CMI. And this is around an organisation for me that is really growing and setting the way. A group of volunteers came up with an idea, brought it to our CEO and the board. They didn't poo-poo it. They didn't say, no, no, that's not the agenda we're on. They saw it as an entrepreneurial way to bring our members together. And for me, look at the great output that we've had as a result of that. Businesses connecting, people learning from each other. That's what businesses should do. And make sure everybody around the table has a voice, not just the same people talking all the time and the same people being listened to. Absolutely. Long answer. No, good answer. Well, and I think, you know, again, you're describing what we have here is what we need in our organizations. And I guess the question is, how do we keep that momentum going? And I think there's some things we're learning best practices. And again, that's what we can do with a conference like this one. Make sure that, you know, we're sharing. Um, uh, you know, again, I think you know, Baroness Lane Fox made a great point. Um, these are really important questions. Don't share them too widely. Well, actually, certainly some of the things we learn here, we do need to share more widely. How do we make um, EDI, you know, a KPI in our business? How does that become something we actually work to? Because it dictates our profit, our innovation, our ability to survive, be sustainable, solve the big problems of today. Um, it is have the right people in the room. That's key. And I think, you know, I still look back and worry that the message that came out of let's suspend gender pay gap reporting during COVID because, you know, we need to focus on the important things, um, you know, is really damaging. And I think we still hear language in business. I, I think about things like, you know, times are really tough. We need a strong leader. What do you picture? What does that mean? What does that language say to people? How do we use it? Um, you know, role modeling, so important in our businesses, but how do we, how do we make that a measurement um, how do we make sure that managers are actually held to account for the teams they develop and support and create? Um, and again, I think those are sort of real KPIs, metrics that matter if we expect to be, you know, sustainable businesses going forward. Uh, Gen Z, as you rightly point out, have a huge role to play in this. Um, you know, certainly in my in my industry, we see this as a bit of, a bit of an inflection point between Gen Z and generative AI. Um, it it really has the potential to be an existential crisis, and I don't think my industry is alone in that. They care about your sustainability objectives. They care about your um, you know metrics in terms of what you look like, and they can't hear a tick box exercise. If they get in the organization and it doesn't align with their values, and the number of times I hear young people say, I can't work there, it doesn't align with my values. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful thing to say and to mean and to actually shape your life and your career around. And if that's what's happening, that tells business, we have to, in a talent war, whatever that looks like, we have to attract the talent mm -hmm by being what the talent wants to work in. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's a real challenge still um, in the face particularly of some of these big existential crises. Very easy to revert to type. Hmm. It's really funny. I was having a conversation with um, a few senior people of a, of, a, of a Japanese bank yesterday. And for me, it was so exciting because they were talking about 
what they needed to do to influence change in the organisation. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that was really predominant in their mindset is we need to support the DNI and the head of talent, but actually what we need to do is bring this into the business. So it becomes the role of the CFO, because the CFO knows when we don't have an inclusive business where females aren't inspired to create and have the careers that that they want, where people who look, who look different don't get the opportunity to work there, there is a cost element to that. Anyone who's a CFO is always interested in the cost side of it. Why are people leaving? Um, why can't we attract people? What's the big gap? All of those things. Then you'll have the head of marketing who's starting to think about the reputation, mm -hmm. the brand. What does the brand stand for? you will have the business development leader who's thinking about, I want to go into new markets. I can't get into those new markets because I don't have anyone that represents who we are. And actually, it's not just always the physical appearance. It's also about the values. We've spoken about values quite a lot today. And actually, people like to do business with people they trust. Mm. People only do business with people who really care about something that's really passionate about change. And we've moved, I think, since COVID, you know, the whole flexible working. I was talking to somebody last week and it was really funny. They were saying, my company is saying I've got to work three days a week in the office and I'm not really happy about that. And I said, three days. Do you remember when you couldn't work from home at all? Mm. That wasn't an option. You now have the option to work from home two days and three days. And if you're a client facing person, I don't expect you to be in the office at all. Mm. You should be out all the time. Exactly. But what I'm saying, we've got to change with the times. Leaders have got to change because actually in today's world, young or old, because people got used to delivering during COVID, they are now saying, unless I can work from home a certain number of days or work from a different area, I don't want that job. Right. They've made choices. So that means we once again have a big hole, big gap of talented people that are going out. Mm. And I'm only going to mention this word once because it makes me smile when we talk about the menopause. <laughs> because women have been around since right. the inception of human beings. Pretty much clear. Right? But it's <laughs> only in the last two years or three years we have got confident talking right. about the menopause. Agreed. We don't talk about it. Mm. And yet still women make up 50% of the world's population. That's a big area that we are seeing women leaving the workforce. Yep. And they're taking all the knowledge with them and they're going and they're setting up their own businesses because they don't feel that there is a place for them in the organisation they work in. So we've got to change that. We've got to think about somebody. I saw Baroness um, Martha Fox walking with a walking stick and I went, oh, my God, join the club. I became part of that club last year. So last year I walked onto the stage with very high heels in a very elegant way. This year I'm in lower heels because... Yeah. Within a couple of months, my life changed. I fell over and broke my ankle. And I all of a sudden became somebody that understood what it was like, totally like, to have a disability. Although mine is not permanent, it affected me for a huge amount of my time. Then add the age on top of that and all the other disabilities that you can see. So what I'm saying to organisations, my brain hasn't stopped functioning, like many other people that haven't. We've got to create a space where everybody feels they can be the best of who they are to work, bring that talent through the building, but also have a sense of belonging. There is nothing prouder when you kind of go somewhere and you feel like, I really belong here. As I was coming up the stairs today, I could see before we even turned in front of the building where I was going because yeah. I could see our colours outside. And then when I saw the word around inclusion outside, I went, I'm definitely in the right place. And it's that sense of belonging because we're talking about something that really matters. Yeah. So for leaders in businesses, yet we've got to be technically skilled to do the job. But actually, that's probably 50% of it. We have to have a real ability to understand and like people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you cannot run a business, despite I see these little robots going around and hoovering the house and cutting the grass and everything. They can't do all the other things that humans are needed to do. So we need yeah. to take care of our human capital. We need to bring the human capital into our workplace. When they're in the workplace, we need to nurture them. We need, we have this thing at the moment where if you're over a certain age, you're not needed anymore. That's rubbish. We need both 
ends of mm. the spectrum. We need the much more mature, which is what I call, I joined that special club. We need the, the people who are from that special club because they bring a sense of confidence, of experience, of resilience that they can share with the younger generation who are really hot on the technology and all things around value. So you bring those two things together. You've got an exciting mix of people who are possibly leading your business in a sustainable way for the future. So that's where we've got to think. We need to forget about just being managers. Managers are people who do tasks. Leaders are people who drive change for an organization. They empower, they engage. They really think about the longer term of what we could look like as a business. And I think that's what's important. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm suspecting that we're preaching to the converted in this audience <laughs> about a lot of that. I think we have to tackle the, the tricky side of this, though. There are still not, um, not all converted people. Um, probably not in this audience, I acknowledge. But people who think that you know, this drive for profitability, the drive to be the best in business, the you know, need to be cutthroat, you know, there's all this language around that. And I think there's a fear that everything we are talking about here is somehow, you know, an anathema to that, that those two things are, are mutually exclusive. And so often I, I certainly hear it in business. You know, you hear about the, the, the bully in the corner office and everyone's lament is, uh, but, you know, we make a lot of money. What no one says, and I think you you got right at the heart of it, Heather, with the suggestion about the CFO, is no one talks about what do we lose from that. Mm -hmm. We're not able to quantify, you know, how much better would our organization be? Actually, how much more profitable? How many more clients? How much better talent will we have if we learned how, you know, to quantify the loss, not just the gain from that, you know, those behaviors that often feel they are not inclusive and, and lead us to be those less inclusive environments. And I think we, we've got to learn how to find ways to quantify that, um, to be able to tackle that sort of tough climate need, you know, real go-getters, sharks, you know, in this environment that somehow feels as if we're saying inclusivity is a nice to have. Um, diversity is a, a thing we have in good times, but, you know, in tough economic climates, we don't. So there's work to be done, and I think a lot of it involves, you know, challenge, um, frankly, challenge that we're getting out of our, our Gen Z, challenge that we're getting out of our, you know, our already diverse um, groups of employees and workers who tell us actually this is how to be a sustainable, profitable, exciting, and innovative business. Um, you know, you have to do this in order to survive. And, and I think we're going to continue to see that tension as we go into even more in a difficult economic time. I'd like to add something because last week it was a very, very special weekend. Mm. How many of you watch the coronation on television? <laughs> okay. I'm going to share something with you. I have a group of, a very diverse group of friends. And some of them said, I won't be watching, I won't be watching the coronation because it will only be all white people or all young people. And I said to them, we're in a different world now. A lot of them watched the coronation and texted me and said, did you know something that we didn't know? And I said, no. Watching that coronation really, it lifted my heart. Mm. And I'll tell you why. I saw all kinds of people, all different backgrounds, performing, being a big part of what's happening. And actually, that changed the mindset of a lot of people. Mm. If organisations could start thinking like that, when you have created something, and it's a very simple thing to do sometimes, when you create something that involves all of society in some way and you make them feel there's a sense of belonging, they, then are, they are encouraged and they tell their families and they tell their friends. When I watched it, can you imagine in the Abbey to see a gospel choir, all black, singing, never in history, mm. to see a Hindu prime minister reading from a Christian Bible, never in history. Mm. So I don't get into politics, but I really do feel there is a change happening. And everyone in this room is responsible for that change. But guess what? We've got to get the message through to the naysayers. And the naysayers who still don't see it, who still think this is mm. the responsibility of the head of diversity or the head of talent to do, 
We need to get it into their mind. It's everybody's responsibility. I watched every minute of that coronation because I could see people that looked like me. I could see people who performed. And I don't just mean the racial element. I'm talking about people with different disabilities, different ages, different colours. It just looked amazing. And when I saw all of those people from the Commonwealth walking through into something which is a very British thing, I realised we're on a journey. So I want you to take that away, you know, and celebrate difference. Celebrate the fact that we look different, we feel different, we speak different, we eat different, we dress different, because that, that's what makes us attractive to people to do business with. And people are interested in talking to people who are interesting. Mm. Couldn't agree more. With that, we're going to invite uh, the rest of our wonderful panel on and carry on some of this great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. We have the best panel, I'm sure of it, um, for you all this morning. Uh, again, I think a little bit more energy uh, to add to uh, Baroness Martha Lane Fox. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves um, because they'll no doubt do it better than anyone. And if they don't, then I'm going to supplement it uh, because they are all fantastic. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to start with you. So I'm Patrick McDonald. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, I'm a member of the CMI Women's Committee. I'm the chair of the Institute of Directors. Uh, I chair a couple of, uh, oh, that's better. Uh, I chair a couple of businesses. Um, sponsored by private equity, uh, Money Penny, which is a call answering business based in Wrexham, um, uh, which has a female CEO, as it happens, uh, and a business called Arcus, which is a facilities management business based in Redditch. Uh, I sit on a couple of other boards as well. I even founded my own school for CEOs, uh, a business <laughs> literally called School for CEOs a few years ago. Um, so I do, I do a number of things, and I'm very, very glad to be here. It's fantastic to be I'm here. I'm delighted to have you. Marie, I'm going to ask you. Thank you very much, Tamara, and um, good morning, everybody. Um, Air Vice Marshal Maria Byford. I am now the Chief People Officer for the Royal Air Force. I was what was called previously the Chief of Staff for Personnel and the Air Secretary. We're a, we're a not very diverse organisation, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning, but we are really passionate about being more diverse and more inclusive. We currently have about 16% women across our regular uniform service and around six, six to six and a half percent ethnic minority um, people in our organization and that is just not good enough. So part of my, my, uh, my, my challenge, my passion and my role over the last three and a half years has been to change the needle on our, our makeup of our organization because as we've heard already this morning we are in a global war for talent um, and I need absolutely the very best people to join the Royal Air Force so that we can fulfill our purpose to be a global air and space power that protects our nation. And that is what is key to me and it's one of my drivers. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Me too, thank you. I feel like we need to stand up and clap for that. <laughs> so, thank you, Paul Hart, last but hardly least. Yes. Well, let's go to you. Um, thank you and um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's been a great conversation already. So my name is Paul Cisse, I'm the CEO of Inclusive Companies and we do lots of DNI kind of initiatives across the UK. One being the inclusive top 50 UK employers, which is a benchmark to see who's the most inclusive employer in the UK. If you're not part of it, why not? Why not say how inclusive you actually are across your different industries? I also won the National Diversity Award, which is all about promoting positive role models, community organizations, people that do exceptional stuff in the community that don't get recognized for what they do. It's a phenomenal kind of awards that, that gets the grassroots of communities right across the whole breadth of the UK. It's not a London century kind of initiative. It's right across the whole of the UK. Um, I also do a consultancy. I've done black leaders. I've done various other DNA initiatives. And the whole thing is about impact and actions. And that's what I, I like to see from organizations. It's not just talking about DNA, but it's also about actions and what you can do to be more inclusive across every single strand of diversity. Perfect. Well, now that we've warned you up, I'm going to start with you, actually. Um, as you've heard, you know, you have an incredible wealth of experience of diversity and inclusion. Um, and we're, you know, there's no question we're all in awe of all of the things that you have done. And I think in particular, you've done so much in the areas of disability, neurodiversity, uh, and sexual orientation, as well as others. I guess I'd like to ask you, you feel that organizations are committed to these other areas of diversity, sort of beyond gender diversity. Um, it's you know clearly been developing for some years. And, and what 
evidence do you have to sort of give us hope about, you know, what we can do to make better progress, um, given all that you are doing? Yeah, I've been in diversity for uh, over 20 years. So I'll, get, I'll be up for a Lifetime Achiever Award soon, I think. Uh, <laughs> only joking. Um, but yeah, I've seen a huge change in, in, in towards other strands of diversity over the years. When I first got into inclusion, it was all about um, LGBTQ plus um, through Stonewall or gender. Uh, and even the gender agenda was not very diverse. I remember me and Heather went to a conference quite a while ago and there was a thousand women in the room. We had the chief executives, um, Heather invited me to that, to that particular conference. And there was only one table of black people on the whole conference of, 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 of a room of a thousand people. And we got talking then that we need to do more and our organizations mm -hmm. need to do more. We have shifted the dial. I think what's happened though, since the uh, unfortunate murder of George Floyd uh, and the subsequent BLM uh, movement has really galvanized DNI as a whole. And, and, and we did an event uh, in London with Penna and we talked about this with the public sector. And it was really, it was really key to the part that, you know, how much has it, how much has he affected diversity? It's not just the black agenda. And there was, for the first time in my lifetime, I'd seen diverse managers, directors of companies uh, all across the board that was in senior positions. And it was, and it was amazing to see, like we see here today. But I, I, I say that with, with an air of kind of caution, because when I went around the room and talked to uh, individuals that are in the senior positions, there was no equity. There was diversity, there was inclusion, but there was no equity within those roles. So people was coming to me and saying, well, I'm a black person, I'm putting put into this directorship role, but I feel like I'm the token black person because of the BLM movement, mm -hmm. or there's, you know, I'm not left involved with that conversation and that the other board members are having, or I'm not getting that piece of work that the other um, um, C-suite is having. And it really broke my heart. And this wasn't just one or two people. This was a lot of people across the board. So we have come a long way across, uh, across uh, different intersectionalities, but we need to do a lot more. And now we need to drive towards equity. And I think that's mm. the most important thing. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, that the Black Lives Matter actually enabled us to have conversations that we weren't having. I think yeah. that's really important. And I remember talking to a fairly senior colleague, black woman, who talked about how um, she'd faced uh, racial discrimination. She'd, her and her brother were um, intercepted on the way to their father's funeral by the police. And she talked about experiences like that that were quite heartbreaking. But we hadn't had those conversations previously. And I think it did give us a platform to have some brave conversations. It's really important. Yeah, yeah. I think that the Black Agenda made people think that, you know, actually when the acronym BAME was there and now mm -hmm. we need to think about, well, what does that actually mean for Black people in the acronym BAME? And it's a different kind of perspective than it is for maybe South Asian or various other people. Uh, and then they became action groups and so on and so forth. And that transpired into other kind of intersectionalities yeah. as well, into other diversities. And that's when organizations want to talk about it as a whole then, which is, which is fantastic. So it gives me hope, but we have got a long way to go. I'm not, it, it, even with the inclusive top 50, no organization is fully inclusive across all strands of diversity. And actually they'll very, be very good at one or two aspects, but they'll be failing down maybe in disability, which is, uh, which is far behind everything else. So disability inclusion needs to, needs to go, mm -hmm. go ahead and, and get better. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, coming out of the, the BLM movement, the biggest word I heard used, and I think it was, it was so hopeful to me, was educate. Everyone felt they needed to go away and educate themselves. There was a recognition, I don't know this, right? I don't know what the problem is, why this happened, why I need to know more. And I guess I'm, you know, as I think about some of the, you know, particularly the point you raise around this sort of equity, or you know, do you really have, you know, agency? Do you have power um, in in an in, a, in an organization? What are the barriers? That, what are the things we're that are holding us back? I mean, we've we've sat back and accepted and acknowledged, and I think there has been a lot of willingness to be educated and to think harder but something is still holding us back. What, what do you see that as being? I think um, from my experience when, even when I went back to George Floyd and there was all these listening groups and it was great that, you know, people are people getting listened to and, you know, getting their mm. points of view about what their feelings are to, towards BLM and, and what's happened with George Floyd. But there was no actions from that. It was just like a listening group. It was like, oh, we, we feel sorry for the blacks. You know, this is, this is what it's like. And, and actually, you know, I harp on, it's all about actions. Look at your data, look at, you know, take your data, look at, look at the lived experience of your uh, employees, look at the data, and then 
you know, analyze that data, talk to your employees and actually take actions from there. So and then you'll find out where the holes and where you need to where you need to be as regards to being a more inclusive organization. <laughs> Last thing I'll say about this is what I want to do is, you know, it's probably quite controversial, but I want to get rid of labels eventually. I, I don't want to be in a job. We shouldn't be having these conversations in 2023. And we should be just talking about talent as a whole, you know, and looking at talent as an individual basis. And that strips away the diversity aspects and looking, well, that person's done really, really good in, in, in the aspects of, uh, of work that they're doing. You know, let's look at them as an individual basis and let's get them promoted to the top. The other bar last barrier is, is, of course, the C-suite as well. Sorry, I'll, I'll stop in a minute. But, um, you know, when the C-suite is not engaged and they haven't got a trusted network of diverse people, has been said before, then nothing's going to move. The dial's not going to change because they haven't got any other perspectives from different different people that are that are in their organization. So that's yeah, that's all I think needs to happen. That's fantastic. I, I love the idea that we would just talk about talent, but I think we have to have full and complete representation in that talent base yeah. in order to have a conversation solely about talent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's you know that's the real critical aspect because it's part of leadership, isn't it? Understanding the lived experience of the people that you're working with. I mean that that's part of being a good leader. It should should be what you want to do anyway. It should be part of your your toolbox as a leader of an organization. So it should mm. come naturally. Yeah. But then I think how many times do we actually have leaders in organizations as opposed to managers? Mm. Because the managers sometimes sit in there waiting to be told you should do this or you should hire that person or you should create this kind of a culture in your organization. But if no one's telling them to do that and they haven't got that confidence in themselves to drive something forward, they're not going to do it. I have a big problem about people from socioeconomic backgrounds because that cuts right across every single one of those mm -hmm. uh, disability strands. And we're at this moment facing one of the biggest crises in our lifetime around the whole economic cost of participation living thing. for sure. We have yeah. got people who cannot yeah. afford to feed their children. Mm. We have got people who cannot afford to get to work. They won't necessarily tell their employers that, but they can't physically get to work because they've got to choose whether I pay the extra in the increase in welfare or I pay the difference in putting the heating on or feeding my children. Sure. Now, that's not something you come to work and shout about, but it's a reality of the world that we live in. And I, I, I feel that unless we do something, we are going to go right back to that place again where the marginalised communities are going to struggle. Mm. And that's something where we've got to get people thinking very different about it's not just race, it's about a sense of belonging, about how do we get our people back to work? How do we then empower them to be the best? How do we then pay them? And I mean, this whole thing about the pay gap, you know what I think uh -huh. about that. How do we pay them a job that is a, a salary that is fair in comparison to what we're paying everybody else? How do we give people a voice for them to feel confident to have that conversation? I hear from so many women and marginalised groups that actually I don't want to say anything because if I say anything, it's going to go against me and I'm going to be seen as, mm. as a troublemaker. Oh, That's God. about the culture of the organisation. And so the work that you do, Paul, around the most inclusive organisations is good because that pulls that out. Mm -hmm. You've got to get some of the stats about how people feel like working in an organisation. Does my line manager listen to me? Do they hear me? And actually, the big thing that I think organisations who don't get this are really struggling commercially will be in today's world when somebody is putting you on a procurement list or choosing your services there are some questions that they oh, are asking absolutely. that you will not get away with those blase answers you've got to provide some hardcore evidence about what you are doing to change the dynamics of the people who work in your organization what are you doing about people attracting people who've got disabilities into the organization we know that people who have got neuro diversity challenges are sometimes the most talented but they don't always get welcomed in an organization mm. they're kind of ostracized we have to change that because of the war on talent yeah. if you want to be the most progressive organization doing the most encouraging things and the more dynamic things you've got to think differently and i think this is where we've got to get to so we need somehow to get those leaders in the room hearing from people who work in their own organizations about the lived experience of working yeah. there. You know, women being in meetings and still being told, shh, that's not your time to speak. 
right? That's still happening. You know, it's still happening in today. And it's still happening in boardrooms, in organisations who win lots of awards and are seen as, you know, thought leaders driving the change. But that stuff is still happening. So no we've got to see how we can change that. No, no question. And I think it is, you know, we're kind of back to that say-do gap. And I think the reality is the tolerance for that gap you know, is, is lower than ever among our workforce and our talent. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, Maria, and come to you. Um, and, you. And I'll have to be honest, this is my favorite part of our conversation because <laughs> I love this. Um, so you've, I know, heard some of the same complaints that I have about using positive action to select candidates who help our organizations become more diverse and thus more uh, effective in the workforce. So one third of men, for example, uh, believe that too much effort is being focused on ensuring a gender balanced workplace. This is according to our Everyone Economy report. Reducing the privilege that has tr traditionally been accorded to particularly white men seems to stir up quite a bit of resentment, it seems. Women though, and let's be clear about this, also present arguments against this approach. I frequently hear, um, I don't want any special consideration. I want to be selected on merit, um, back to this sort of token concern uh, frequently. Um, as though, and this is what really bothers me the most, I have to admit, as though somehow um, those two things, positive action and merit, are mutually exclusive. So even though you know, the media get in on this act fairly regularly and some sources have derided your diversity efforts um, as pandering to political correctness, um, others try scaremongering by saying that attempts to create a diverse force put our security at risk. Just contemplate Baroness Martha Lane Fox's comments as well. So can you address, um, Maria, how you've handled resistance from men, women, and the media about your approach to creating the best RAF the UK has ever had? Yeah, no, thank you, Tamara. I find, I think it's so funny that People think that if you have more women, then um, you would be um, operationally less effective because clearly they wouldn't be able to fly a combat aircraft as well as a man could fly a combat aircraft, for example. And we know actually that's not the case. Um, we do know that when we go to look to select people to, 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 um, to join our flying profession, um, um, depending on the, the uh, parameters that we set for selection, we can, we, uh, we'll actually bring a more inclusive workforce in. So for example, if we focus on attributes like leadership um, and motivation for the role, we will, we will actually triple the number of women who pass the selection test. So it's really interesting looking at the different parameters that we use mm -hmm. in selection. For me, my bottom line in my organization is about operational effectiveness. It's being the most operationally effective fighting force we can be to defend our nation. To do that, I need to have absolutely the best people um, in the Royal Air Force who can give of their best because they are allowed to be themselves um, and, and the organisation around them, the culture and behaviours around them allows them to operate at their best and most effectively. And at the same time, we look after their families and we support their communities because we have a slightly different employee proposition mm -hmm. to a standard company. Now that is the that is absolutely the message that we have used to to um, to overturn the argument around positive action. This is not about positive action. This is about ensuring that we have access to all the talent that is available. And currently, in an organisation which is over eighty percent white male, I am not accessing all of the talent that is available uh, and, uh, and that we could bring into into the Royal Air Force. And that means that um, in in a country that is fifty one percent female. Uh, and in demographic that it's going to be, for the recruiting demographic that, that I'm focused on, in 2030 is going to be 25% from an ethnic minority background. We have to broaden our appeal and we have to access communities and elements of society who just don't see us as an employer of choice. That's absolutely key going forward. So that's the message that we've got, that we've got to talk about. Um, there are always going to be um, differences in how... Um, men and women view themselves within the workplace and it's absolutely fascinating in terms of um, when I talk to my um, very talented women in the organization about putting themselves forward for opportunities they quite often won't because they will look at a job specification that'll have 10 criteria and they they will 
they will tick off nine of them, but they don't think they can do the 10th and they won't then apply for the role. Whereas I can put the same job specification in front of a male colleague, who can probably only cover one of two on the list mm -hmm. and they will still put themselves forward for right. the role. And that's, those are the kind of, uh, I guess, gender related challenges that we've got to get over. And one of the ways we would do this is by the allies that we have within our organization and around our organizations. And it's the men in the room that I need to, to help us in that, in some of those conversations and some of those debates, because it's the allies that will actually help us um, encourage and promote our talent and overturn the, the negative narrative around um, positive action and positive right. um, um, and the tools that we need to actually level the playing field. It's a perfect example of where positive action is the absolute right answer. The woman who can do nine tenths of the job should get the job. Yeah, yeah. but you need to yeah. positively encourage yeah. and yeah. bring forward and, yeah. and you know make that happen. So um, I must admit, one of my biggest bugbears is this, you know, we must hire the best person for the job. But there are very few, if any, jobs out there where it is a solo person doing something. What you really need is the best person for the team. Yeah. And often that includes the, the thing you don't have. Where are your gaps? What are you looking for that you don't have in the team? That then becomes the best person for the team or the jobs that you are all trying to do. Um, and I love that you're accomplishing that. So kudos Thank to you. you. Thank you. Um, Patrick, I'm going to turn to you. Um, and again, I have to say, Patrick is, uh, as he already described, eminently cool. And one of the coolest things about Patrick um, <laughs> is his LinkedIn profile, which I love because it says it's all about people. Um, and I think as a seasoned director across a variety of industries, you know, you have a unique perspective to offer us on the role of managers and leaders um, and what drives our organizations to be all about people. So can you give us a few specific things that you think, you know, make the difference in the short term, um, even while we are trying to get to EDI, you know, what makes the difference? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I mean, I write it's all about people because I'm an ex-strategy consultant. You know, I used to believe it's all about strategy. Uh, then I worked for GE, you know, led by the CEO of the century, Jack right. Welch. It was all about execution. And over time, I've realized it's really all about people. Right. Everything is all about people. So that's why I put that there. It's almost to remind myself that uh, when I start to get too, too geeky about things. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, look, I, I think in the short term, you, you need to, to, to talk the talk and you need to walk the walk. So I think as a leader, you have to want to make this happen and you have to talk about it. You know, people say that what gets measured gets done and that's true, but what gets asked about gets done. Mm -hmm. If you ask about it and talk about it, people will start to model that. People will start to try and respond to that. People will try and make things happen. So I think just, just talking about it's really important. Um, if you want a more diverse organization, say so and keep saying so mm -hmm. and keep asking about it. And then I think you have to walk the walk. You have to make things happen. And you asked about the short term. You know, I think the, the quickest thing you can do in the short term is make sure that your long lists and your short lists are diverse mm. uh, and your succession plans are diverse. And insist that the headhunter goes and delivers to you a diverse long list and short list. And some of them will go, absolutely, I want to do that. And some of them will explain how hard it is. And some mm -hmm. will explain that there's no one in the industry, blah, 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 blah. I don't care. I insist upon a proper long list and short list. And it's amazing how if they are pushed to, to do something, they will find more diverse talent mm -hmm. and you will have a much better long list and short list. And some of those people on merit, you'll want to promote uh, or, or, or put in, in place, um, recruit. And, and I've recruited and promoted female chief executives, chairs, uh, non-execs, finance directors. Mm. Um, there's great talent out there if you go out there and make it happen. So, so to me, it's, it's talk the talk right. and walk the walk. I'll tell you one other thing. I, I have even turned down a job because I felt the organization was too blokey. And I said to them, you know, this is fantastic. You know, you're a wonderful, you know, you're obviously going places. You need a female chair. You know, you don't need me. You need a female chair because you are much too blokey. Um, and I turn what did it they say? They hired a bloke, of course. But <laughs> you can only do they so didn't much. take your good advice. No, they didn't. What take a show. Can I just add to that? That networks yeah. are the key to a sense of belonging for lots of organizations. Yeah. Yeah. From what we know in the inclusive companies, yeah. 
I think when the C-suites engage and the networks are actually talking and saying their lived experiences as a collective, that's so powerful uh, to, to many organizations to sit there and say, well, you know, I've been in this job for 20 years. My white counterparts have all had promotions, but I'm still in the same job. And this happens time and time again. And you have to take actions from that. And I just think networks are the, are the key to, to, to get, get that. Absolutely. Capacity. Yeah. Your, your best source of talent is people you know or people who know the people that you know. Go out and work, work the networks. Make it happen. Yeah. Mm. Well, we've talked about a lot of very positive things I'm going to just ask because it can be a minefield, EDI. And you know, I think there are some concerns that managers and leaders have about navigating EDI generally. What are your thoughts and your views on that? I think it's the other way around. I think it's a huge opportunity. You know, you want the best talent on your team and you want a diverse team. You know, the one thing you want to avoid on a team is groupthink. Right. You need people with different experiences, different things to bring to the party. Uh, I, I think it's completely the other way around. I, I think if you're not doing this, you're missing a massive trick. But it also includes the white males to that talent as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. People seem to forget about oh, yeah. that when we yeah, talk yeah, don't about inclusion as a whole. It means absolutely yeah. everybody. And I think yeah. that sometimes gets missed and the white males sometimes are sitting there like, well, and what about us, like you said feeling. before? And they're actually feeling it. And that's the one message that we want to get across. We just want equality across every strand of diversity. I want my daughter to be able to go to an organization and know that she can get to the very top when she's done the GCSEs that she's doing currently now. She's, I think she's in biology. Um, so good luck, Jasmine. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's really important that you know there's just equity and equality for everybody. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And I think it, I think that is important. It you know comes back to this sense of you know inclusion has to be everyone. Why, why wouldn't you do this? Right. I just, I've never really understood why you would sort of restrict well, your your pool of talent to a sort of uh, specific type. You know, a clique. You want to break open the cliques. You, you, yeah. If you're going to take good business decisions, yeah. you want to put together a team that brings different things to the party. I think it's fair. Fair stops people from building those inclusive because they're now not thinking of the wider population, not even thinking about the organisation. They're thinking, if you bring that person in, my job's at risk. Yeah. Insecurity. And that creates a different energy. If you bring that person who's good at technology, it's going to create avoiding my part of the business because we're used to doing everything manually by spreadsheet. And if you bring in somebody who's a technology, it means that two people who worked in my business now gets reduced to one. It's all right. Chat GPT is going to do it all. Take care of it all anyway. <laughs> None of us are ever going to have to work again now, right? right? So. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, you know, I do think there is this concern about, um, it made me think, Patrick, as you spoke about the business case, you know, that we've always had to build for including women. Um, and, you know, I think I've always wondered, well, what was the business case for not <laughs> including them? Mm. Why didn't we ever have to build that? Mm. You know, and I think it's the same for inclusivity generally. It's, yeah. you know, what is the business case for being exclusive? Um, because no one's really ever been able to articulate that. Well, look, we have this extraordinary group of people here um, and we have this extraordinary group of people out there. And now is a moment where we can um, have you all ask questions of this great panel. Um, so I'd love to invite questions from the audience. We may need some light for that, but um, and I hope somebody has a microphone. Um, I see a hand over here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Patricia Lynn. I'm the EDI representative on the Northern Ireland Board. Um, first of all, let me say that was a fascinating panel, really thought provoking. I'll be thinking about it for the next couple of days. But my question is really simple. Um, and I'll ask the question and I'll give you some of the background. My question is, how do you define what inclusion is on whose terms and within what boundaries? Because from a Northern Irish perspective, our peace agreement, for example, is healed up internationally to be the most inclusive legislation to end conflict in the world. Our government's been collapsed for nearly half the time it's existed. At the same time, Northern Ireland is held up as a case study of inclusivity. I have worked in some of the organisations that proclaim inclusivity to the hills and have been entirely toxic, dismissive. I've also been a, a leader that's broken through at a youngest age, being a CEO, a special advisor, most recently a legislator. And once I got in, people were saying Northern Ireland's changing. But whenever I got in, 
that was when I experienced the most toxicity, the most exclusion, the most degradation from people that I would have look, looked up to. So whenever we say we have a journey to travel, we do. My concern is if we rely on legislation to set the agenda for what counts as inclusion, we're going to fall short. And nowhere do I see inclusion defined outside of quite dry legislation. Mm -hmm. So what is inclusion? Fantastic question. First of all, kudos to you. Um, what a great career you have. Uh, and, I, you know, look, I think I'm going to ask this panel if they want to take a stab at it, but you're certainly raising, I think, the very points we've been talking around, um, which is, you know, each organization kind of gets to describe that for itself. W what do we demand as a society? What is Gen Z, for example, demanding of, you know, the workplace generally? Um, is it right to leave it all to them? Shouldn't we be doing more with, you know, governments demanding it? I think those are very fair questions, but but what is inclusivity? Anybody have a thought? Well, I mean, the Institute of Directors has not necessarily been terribly diverse in the past. Mm. And we've recognized that and we've changed. Mm. Um, and we are making uh, a big effort to be more inclusive. Uh, and, and our goal is to reflect the society that we represent. Sure. It's as simple as that. That's our definition of inclusion. Um, and we put a lot of effort into it, continue to put a lot of effort into it. Uh, I'm glad to see that, say that the, the members coming in are much more diverse than they used mm. to be. We're not where we want to be yet, but we're much more diverse than we used to be. Um, I mean, you know, we're, we're doing things. Just last week, we held, held a um, Balance in Business Awards dinner, uh, which I you know all about. It was a pleasure to be there. It was great. Uh, <laughs> celebrating diverse leadership groups in, in British businesses. Um, so... As I say, for, in turn, answer your question in terms of definition to reflect the society that we represent. Yeah. I think it's a great question. I'll just quickly say we've, you know, we've talked about data and what we, you know, what we talk about in our organizations. And I will admit to seeing organizations, including my own, struggle with, you know, what are we trying to be representative of? Is it, you know, is it the pool of talent for our profession? Is it the pool of, you know talent in the wider world? Is it the pool of talent in the UK? Is it, you know, and I think, you know, to your question, that can be tricky. Um, if we're trying to do something that is purely, you know, a tick box exercise, are we there? Instead, I think it is much more about the sense of belonging, the real feeling of inclusion, as opposed to the fact. Um, the fact is the targets and the efforts we make. The feeling is kind of the outcome in that. I don't know that you can legislate for that, but I think you can do what Patrick suggests in the beginning of his discussion, which is talk a lot about it. Um, well, I think the other <laughs> other piece around this is is what inclusion isn't, and it's some of the barriers that we've talked yeah, about. Right. And it's it's things like the culture and behaviours within the organisation, the way that people behave towards each other, actually makes people feel excluded from from um, whatever organisation or society they are in. It's the language that we use. So language can be a real barrier to inclusion as well. And certainly from an Air Force perspective, we've removed terminology like airmen and air women. Not only is it clunky to say, but it, it doesn't feel very inclusive at all. We talk about aviators. We've actually stopped talking about D and I, and we only talk about inclusion now mm -hmm. because when I talk about diversity and inclusion, I'm constantly reminding people why they might be different and it stops them feeling included. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to examine the barriers as, and I absolutely agree with you, Tamara. I don't think inclusion is an organisation. It's an organisational objective, but it's felt at an individual right. level, and it will feel differently for everybody. And I, that's why I think it's really important to have things like shadow boards or um, challenge absolutely. boards, yeah. red teaming, absolutely. because everybody will have their own um, um, perspective that's built on their own experiences and their own lived experience that they can reflect back. Um, so it's certainly, something that that we um, champion is using a shadow board to challenge all of our board's thinking because it's not a particularly diverse board and it needs that diverse opinion as well. I think it's really, it's also quite important to listen to the, the language that people use when they're talking about your organisation. Not What does it look like to work there? Because sometimes you can have a, a, a board that looks very diverse, but actually underneath it's not at all diverse. They've just been put there as token <laughs> to make it look that way. But actually, if you ask people, how does it really feel to work in the organization and and in today's world people will will eloquently put that on social yes. media right 
And so if you've got a really good marketing team that's good at going to collect that data, that will give an insight into what's really going on. Now, what you have to do with that data is bring it back to a board that's prepared to listen, not, not a board that's prepared to say, well, no, that doesn't really relate to us, or that was on a bad day, or that was on that day, or that was happened when George Floyd died, or any of that stuff. It is data, and the data is what we have to work with and understand where we're going. And I feel that when it looks at people coming into your organisation, and this is where I think HR and the talent uh, community can do a lot, who are the people that are applying to your organisation? That tells you a lot about the culture. Who are the people that are getting to the interviews? That also tells you about the culture. And when people come in, are they getting the same buddying, the same support through that first six to 12 months transitioning into a role? And actually, when people leave, do we really do exit interviews? Because if you even look in your own organisation, sometimes people say, well, we've been too busy to do that. But actually, an exit interview is something that is one of the most valuable gifts you can get for an employee. It doesn't always have to be bad. Somebody could be leaving an organisation because it's, part of, it's not part of their growth trajectory at that moment in time. But if you don't ask why they're leaving, you will also not uncover some of the bad behaviours that perhaps resulted in that. And I, I hate to mention this, but the CBI have been around for many, many, many years. I am one of the privileged people that have been to many of those CBI conferences. But I can tell you, for many years, I felt there was only two people of colour or two black people in that room, and that was me <laughs> and, and another partner, a, a lady who was a partner of a professional services. And we just look at each other, and it was very much a club that we felt excluded from. Now, if at some point somebody had been brave enough to say, why, given that the CBI represents all of these hundreds of businesses and the de demographics of those businesses, why does it feel and look that way? And that's what people should be asking an organisation. If it's a bank, for instance, who's a regional bank all over the country, and there are certain pockets where they haven't got the clients that they should have, something's not right. And somebody needs to ask that question. Now, that will take a very bold and confident board leader to say, will somebody bring me the data as to what are the, what's the process that's happening perhaps in Wrexham as opposed to the process that's happening in Birmingham? Mm. And that gives you the point for where change needs to happen. Absolutely. So I think the last point is... Um, I always I do a lot to do with conscious inclusion, working with leaders and working with some quite toxic organizations that have the same experience as what you do and just draw on their own experiences about what they have uh, within their own lives. So some senior leaders will have maybe a child with autism or they might have some mm -hmm. dyslexia and so on and so forth to so kind of draw on their own experiences first. And then we do something like a little kind of workshop with them where we look at how many people are in your trusted network. We ask them to write down, let's say 15, and then we say, okay, you've got 15 people in your, in your trusted network. So how many are from a LGBT background? How many people from a race background? How many people from a disability background? And, they'll, and most of the time they'll say, well, we don't, oh, well, no one, they're all from, they're all, that's Bill and there's, there's Joe and they have live in a nice suburban area, so and so and so forth, and they're from a certain university. So we ask them to be conscious about their, their, their inclusion. So open up their mind to, to diverse people so that they can have a diverse train of thought as well. So I think that's, a, that's some way to try and change in the dial with the organization, with senior leaders sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. I think in your case, the speak up culture might be the most important thing, you know, that we could really think about fostering inclusion is just, you know, people have to feel empowered to say, I don't feel included. You know, it's not okay that somebody spoke mm. to me that way or, you know, that I was told this. And, you know, that's important. Can I add a very small point? Because this happens quite a lot. If you have an organisation where there are a group of people that have worked there for 20 years or 15 years, they've all worked together, mm. they're all diverse. But the point of making someone feel excluded now is not one of the marginalised areas, but the fact that they've all worked together for 20 or 30 years. So you as a new person coming in, can sometimes feel very, very excluded. Yeah. And actually, how do you address that? How do you bring that up? And how does somebody in an organization say, well, how is person A settling in? Because when we talk about the good old days, they don't know about the good old days. When we talk about going to dinner at this particular place, they don't have that experience. So it's about creating a sense of belonging. Exclusion isn't necessarily 
And inclusion isn't necessarily about what you can see, it's definitely what you feel. Yeah. We had another question out here. Um, I thought I could see. Lady in the middle. There we go. Thank I'm going to try and get up. The lights. <laughs> so comfy in that seat. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Caroline Whitehead. I am on the CMI Women's Board with Tamara, Patrick, and formerly with Heather. Um, and I know Paul. <laughs> so um, my question is, is that you were talking about speaking up. Um, yes, we're part of CMI. Some people are guests. I brought some guests with us. But we're not exclusive. We're members of other organisations. What advice can you give us to speak up? Because I'm not afraid to speak up. <laughs> now, and what I want to say is I have been frozen out or ghosted in organisations when I have spoken up. I've not been upset about it. I know they're not worthy of my my time. But what advice can you give to other people who want to go back and speak up about inclusivity and the lack of? It's a great question, Carolyn. I think we're going to finish the panel with that. So I'm going to ask each of you um, to answer that fantastic question. <laughs> so I think in any organisation with any issue, including this one, you have to work out how you're going to get done what you went what you want to get done so what are the end what's the objective you know where are you trying to get to and then you have to work out the means you know do you speak up publicly do you talk quietly do you go and after a one one on one meeting with you know the, the chief exec or the chief people officer i think i think and it's different in each situation um, and only you can work out what the best way is so to me it's 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 like any other issue in the sense that you've got to work out where you want to get to and you have to work out how you're going to get there and you may have to work at it for some time you know but persist in my in my experience persistence is one of the most important skills you can bring to a business situation and and i think you have to be persistent can i just so, so from my experience what, what's actually happened so i, I was chairing a, a black network i think i mentioned it before and the chief executive was present in this black network and we had uh, representation from all across the UK. And uh, they were talking about their lived experiences within um, their own organization. And again, as, as I said before, they were saying, well, I've been in this job for 15 years. I'm not getting this promotion. Somebody else from another part of the country saying, I've not had this and this is my experience. And I, you know, I've applied for this job three times and quite qualified to do this job. Why am I not getting this job? It kept it happening over and over again. And the chief executive was present in that. And it's, it's, it's really crucial that the senior leadership are present within the network so they can li listen to the lived experience. And then it's down to the power of the network. Say, so, well, what actions are you going to take? It's not just about you listening to us, but what actions are you going to take you know, for us to move forward as, as, as black people within an organization or any diversity within an organization? And if they're not taking any notice of what that network is saying, then maybe it's time to move to a different organization because they're not going to be progressive. But you've just got to keep harping on, uh, like Patrick said, and, and keep that message coming. Um, because if it happens to a black network, it's probably happening to the disability network. Absolutely. It's probably happening to the LGBTQ plus network. And so if you come as a collective as well, then you know, I think the organization will have to listen. I do think it's really important that you hold on to your voice. Do not lose the essence of your voice and surround yourself with people that encourage your voice to be heard. And if it's not the right organization, that you'll get that feeling. You're, you know, they're not deserving of you. But the other thing to do is think about, rather than just be a lone voice, think about what the objectives of, what's the vision of the organisation, what are the things that they're saying. Use that to bring the case back to them. So if they mm. talk about being totally inclusive to represent the market share that we're trying to secure, well, actually, that's the starting point for your conversation with them. That No one will turn you away from talking about business, mm. but you have to do it in a way that is really eloquent and eloquent and, and you've got to be confident in what you're saying. So try it out with somebody who is a supporter of yours so that the tone of your voice is right, the message that you want to land with them is right. I can remember many years ago when I set up a women's network in the bank, quite a lot of the leaders said, well, what are they going to do? Talk about burning their bras and all of that kind of language. And what I did, I could have got really defensive, but I thought, no, I'm going to pick him out on purpose. And I sat down with him. I didn't take my bra off or anything like that. Let me just tell you. <laughs> but what I did say to him was, we're trying to create something that's going to help change the way we do business in the bank. I would really appreciate your feedback as to what we're doing and how we're doing it really well. Do you know, that man changed his mindset because I brought him into the conversation. He was then able to go back 
literature to the board and tell them, you know, I've had a conversation and this idea looks really good. And I remember my boss at the time said, what did you say to him? What did you do? I said, nothing. I just asked him if he could be a man. Help me with a project that as a woman, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> right? And so sometimes we've got to be very clever in our style about, it's a sales pitch, right? When you really believe in something, you've got to think about the way that you can get the individuals or the group of people to buy in and take it back as a business idea. Mm. It cannot be a nice, fluffy idea that's going to yeah. you know, make us all come to work singing and dancing. Leaders don't buy that. What they do buy is talent, commerciality, and market share. Mm. Love that. How are you coach this year? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maria, we're going to I'm going to throw one in as well. And I'm going to go back to the um, Everyone Economy report. And it talks about a number of actions within there. And one of those is about being a storyteller and being a role model. And it's a bit about being advocates for others. So, so my one of my personal favourites is not the being told to shut up, but it's when you bring up an idea and it gets dismissed. And then 20 minutes later, one of your male <laughs> colleagues comes up with exactly the same idea. Yeah. And the chair goes what a brilliant idea. And you sit there thinking, I'm sure I just said that. But then you need to say that was yeah. my idea. I'm really glad that you've taken you, it. You, yeah. can, exactly. you can do that. But what you've also got to do is spot when that happens to other people. Yeah. And speak call up. it out. Exactly them. Right. So I think, so keep, keep speaking up. Keep saying what you've got to say. I think that's really important. Yeah. It's my favourite cartoon. Wonderful point, Mrs. Jones. Would one of the boys like to make it? You know, <laughs> always, always good. Well, can you join me in thanking this fantastic panel this morning? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.